note uh, for another installment of our Meet the Professional series. Uh, tonight, we have uh, professionals from several fields in the tech industry, uh, including software development, cybersecurity, UX design, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. Uh, we'll start off uh, with this event with some general questions uh, for all of our speakers, uh, and then we'll go into more speaker-specific questions. And then uh, finally, with uh, any time that's remaining, uh, we'll take some questions uh, from the audience. So during the initial Q&A portion, if you do have any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat and uh, we'll queue those up for you. Um, just a couple of house rules, just be sure to be respectful uh, in the chat, both to our speakers as well as our fellow audience members. Uh, and please be sure to stay muted uh, while the speakers are answering questions uh, just out of respect. Uh, now I'll just kind of go through and we'll have the uh, speakers introduce themselves. Uh, first up, we have Jeff. Hi hey everyone, uh, my name is Jeff Armstrong. I work at Shopify and I'm a staff software developer. Um, my favorite language is Go. And a fun fact about myself, I um, actually did a music degree at Laurier followed by a comp sci degree. And I was one of the co-founders of Phi. Awesome. Uh, next up we have Farzia. Hi everyone, my name is Farzia Khan. I'm a senior manager of cybersecurity experience at the TD Bank. Uh, my favorite programming language would be JavaScript and I'll tell two fun facts about me. One is this, that I speak six languages and no, not, I'm not referring to programming languages. Um, and apart from that, for my high school, I actually taught myself entire high school just through Google and online. Thank you. That's really impressive. Um, yeah, next up we have Carlos. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Carlos Perez. I am the co-founder of a company called Purple Sector Strategy. That's uh, my own company. Um, my favorite programming language, language even though I uh, am in design, um, I'm quite fond of uh, JavaScript because that's how I uh, got to do things in browser for myself uh, rather than relying on the developers sometimes. So uh, that's that was uh, uh, my favorite. Uh, fun fact is I'm a huge Formula One fan uh, and my race day uh, ritual for uh, my whole family is we, uh, that's the day we eat croissants. Uh, so every Sunday there's a race, the uh, croissants are on the menu. So uh, that's, uh, that's it about me. All right, awesome. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, next up we have Iman. Mute. Oops, uh, muted. Yeah. I think now it's better, right? Awesome. So my name is Iman Abudaga. Um, I work for Microsoft. I'm the data and AI business and product leader covering Canada. I work with a big group of uh, smart people between technical and business in order to make sure we have uh, we help uh, between our customers and consumers. Uh, more to understand about the cloud digital transformation journey and, and AI. Uh, I'm not going to say preferred language because I don't do um, um, like development by myself, but I would uh, say my preferred, preferred platform is Azure. Uh, and if you don't know Azure, it's the Microsoft Cloud Platform. Fun fact about me, when I'm depressed or worried, I do cooking. So I go and, and cook some, try some uh, crazy recipes from uh, other parts of the world. So this is what uh, what I do. Great, thank you. Uh, last up, we have uh, Shitej. Uh, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Shitej. Um, I'm a software engineer, machine learning at Google, um, working on some of the ML problems in the ad space. Uh, so favorite programming language for me is Python. Um, so I love like um, writing code in uh, like all the machine learning code in Python. Uh, fun fact, um, during the recent lockdown, I picked up like um, doing a thousand piece puzzle and I'm just loving it right now. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Shatish. Uh, so a huge thank you to all of our speakers tonight for taking the time out of their busy schedules uh, to be here and to teach us all a little bit uh, about their respective fields. Uh, I'll now pass it over to Seville, who will start with our uh, first round of questions for our speakers. So thank you everyone for your amazing introductions and for your time again, and let's just jump right into it. So first we have some general questions directed at all of you. And first we have some university related questions. So 
what projects do you remember working on while being a student that made your por portfolio stand out? So for example, like getting an internship or an interview. I guess I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, so when I was uh, at university, my goal was actually to go the academic route at first. So I was planning to do a master's, which I did end up starting, but not finishing. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't uh, do a co-op um, because I didn't think I would need it, but uh, I would highly suggest doing that if you can. Um, so when I went to, into industry, I found it actually pretty hard to get a first job because I didn't have a lot of experience in, in order to stand out. Um, so I can, I can just share with you some of the things that I did put on my resume. Um, so I had a, like a shape recognition project that I did as like an undergrad research project. And I published a paper on that. Um, I had like a, an OCR project in, in grad school as part of my coursework that used genetic algorithms and support vector machines. I had a web app that kind of like did this uh, like auto marking of assignments. So you could like, as a student, you could hand in a, a, like a programming assignment and it would like run test cases against it and mark it. Um, I made like a networked battleship game and like a 3D tank game, kind of like a first person shooter type thing, but with a tank. And those were all like uh, school projects um, related to my, my coursework. Um, so what my personal experience was, I found that those types of things actually didn't make me stand out that much, even though I, like I tried to show a, a variety. And I think the, the thing that really got me in the door to, to a job was actually connections. So I, I knew some friends from, from school who already had jobs and were able to like get me that interview. And once I got into that, then, then it was easier. Yeah, I would say um, I didn't have, I actually uh, went to Laurier and did uh, business, I had a business degree. Um, and I tried uh, my hardest uh, with my first co-op job at RIM uh, with any, well, I wound up working at RIM, but I, I tried to get anything that wasn't web related because that was something I had learned myself uh, in high school. And then I came to university. I'm like, no, I'm here for marketing. I don't, that's, back when it was like, I'm not doing marketing, I'm going to do web stuff instead, not knowing that's the same thing in, in a lot of cases. Um, but um, tried my hardest not to do anything web related, try to get a marketing job, try to use the school uh, uh, experience that I had been developing at the time, um, and wound up with a couple of interviews uh, and a couple of no's. And my resume went from the marketing team at RIM to the web team at RIM because they're like, this guy knows web stuff. And uh, I wound up, uh, even though I was trying to find it as much as possible, uh, with a, a job on, on the web team, uh, the marketing web team of all things. So uh, it was, uh, even though I was trying, you know, my plan was to go in one direction, uh, it was still uh, relying on experience from outside of school uh, that wound up being what got my foot in the door. So, and then I finally did wind up on the, on the marketing team eventually, years later. That's great. I think maybe I can go next because I think I have maybe like an interesting story to share. I would say I think a lot of the projects that I worked that maybe stood out is the things that I did outside of my coursework. So a lot of the leadership positions that I took were really, I would say, helpful to me. And I would say, um, I think how I landed my even first job, which technically was not even an internship, but rather, you know, full con kind of like a contract job was, you know, I was, uh, you know, because of all the leadership things that I was involved in, I got selected as, you know, one of the top 30 female students from all over Canada to advise the CEO of the Bank of Montreal at that time on the future of work. And I would say through there, you know, through, through I would say um, that event and, you know, that session, I was able to connect with other executives at the bank. And one of the executives, I would say, you know, just really liked me. And, you know, six months later, I don't even know how she remembered me, but um, she reached out to me and said, you know, um, I have an interesting summer, you know, contract job. Do you want that? And I was working there 
But I would say what's really interesting is this, that I, I took up that job and I started working full time while having a full time course load, which was crazy. Um, and again, I would say it, it was a really gratifying experience, but I wouldn't recommend it to everyone because unless you can do it and pull it off. But I was so crazy. I decided, you know, just, you know, having like a full course load and, you know, full time job as if that's not enough. I'm, I decided, you know, I'm going to do I'm going to organize a hackathon. And I would say at that time, I had no idea, you know, like how much work it takes to organize an event. So um, I saw that, you know, we never had like an all female hackathon in Canada. There were a few in the US. Now I would say there are quite a bit, but at that time there were any. There weren't any. So I decided, you know, why don't I just create one? I was going to York University at that time. And I would say um, I ended up, you know, coming up with a rough plan. I told my university I didn't have any sponsors, you know, so obviously you can imagine how crazy it was. But somehow I would say I ended up making that hackathon happen. I reached out to the companies, you know, Microsoft ended up sponsoring it. Then eventually Google, um, you know, Shopify, Deloitte, uh, Hydro One, you name it, some big companies ended up sponsoring. And I would say post that hackathon, it's interesting because Although I was already working as a contract in a, my contract position, which was paying me really well, um, I didn't have a full time, I would say, like post graduation. I wasn't even sure what I wanted to do. But after I did that hackathon, I, you know, I ended up getting featured in the newspaper and uh, I literally had, I would say, like five, six offers. So without anyone ever looking into my resume, I had, you know, offers from so many different companies, I would say, you know, and connections. In fact, uh, I ended up, you know, including from companies like, you know, they all wanted to talk to me like Microsoft, RBC, TD, you name them, uh, Shopify. And I would say I ended up getting even like a golden ticket from Deloitte. And that was a really interesting thing, which they used to, I don't know if they still do it, but they said they got the idea from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory where, you know, kind of one person that they meet or one student they meet out of so many different events um, is going to get like a golden ticket like one or two, you know, few. And basically that means you got the job with no interview. You decide which project you want to work on. And as you can imagine, that was like a very exciting thing for me. And eventually I ended up going with BMO because they ended up offering me a full-time position as well. But because I you know I was reporting directly to a vice president and I was getting, I would say like a much senior role and stuff like that. So obviously ended up going with that. But I think just the fact that, you know, sometimes it's great to do like good coursework and it's good, but I think you also have to show your work. So when you're able to do something, you know, that everybody's able to see, and I think being able to pull off like a hackathon, everything like from scratch, like, you know, coming up with a sponsorship package, talking to the companies, organizing it, putting it together and, you know, having that good, I would say communication skills as well, really, I would say makes you stand out. Whereas when you're doing a coursework, you can only put it on your resume and no one really else is there to speak for your work. So I would say things that I did outside of my coursework really helped me stand out. And then next we have Iman. I can go next. Yeah, so I graduated as um, a computer engineer. I had a bachelor's degree in computer engineering. And at that time I was doing, uh, when uh, I got my first and second job, I was doing so much of handiwork, connecting networks, fixing, uh, um, even sometimes uh, PCs doing um, um, programming and all of those stuff together. Uh, however, um, um, when, when I decided to look for another job after my, uh, while I'm in my second one, uh, while doing um, a few interviews, I started seeing something else in myself and so many of the people around me advised me to look into the sales to sales roles, technical sales roles. They thought that I have that personality. I took the shot with Microsoft and I tried that and, and the, that worked. So I discovered a salesperson inside me <laughs> was speaking tech technology. So uh, within one year, uh, I became the leader for the um, inside sales team within the Nepa region there in the, in the Gulf region. And from where, where I had my journey started um, because after my first role uh, as a team leader for the inside sales account team, I moved to the hosting team and um, witnessed the whole cloud journey in the Gulf region and there where I also, uh, that was a big opportunity for me to, to start looking into other regions and geographies. That's why I'm here in Canada today, working in the Canadian sub, um, um, managing the uh, AI and data business um, uh, under the product group team. Uh, so I guess I can go next. Mm -hmm. uh. 
So yeah, so I think uh, for me, um, like I would say my journey is like uh, similar to more like a Jeff. And then like um, I was looking for um, some academic um, academic degrees. And so I had a, like um, my resume had a lot of mixture of like both um, research, theoretical work and also like applied work. So I think that kind of helped out that um, it helped me to reach for the positions that were like purely software engineering, but also positions that were like more software related. Um, the fun story that like basically how did I actually get my the job just after getting from school is that I was um, I went to my prof saying that like oh um, I want to drop this course uh, this is like uh, I'm not really enjoying it it's like uh, really heavy and he told me yeah okay I'll sign this form just uh, let's just chat for 10 minutes and then in the 10 minutes like he ended up actually pitching me a job offer there and so when I came out of his office I actually like um um, I I was not able to draw from the course, but I had an interview lined up. And so that's how I ended up like basically um, getting my first job. But then, um, uh, so that's like, I think that's like nice. I think what like other people have iterated that like um, that connections really help. I mean, no matter where the connections are coming from, from friends, uh, faculty members, your colleagues, et cetera. Uh, in terms of like things that stand out, I think it's just like, in my opinion is that like, um, I think having a breadth of things really help that instead of just focusing on one particular thing that like, then it makes you like more robust to like different kind of offers, different kind of opportunities, which you might not know. Um, you might be thinking you want to just go in like MLAI, but then there might not be any openings in MLAI. And so if there's opening comes in like, um, like a traditional software engineering or something like a more marketing uh, based engineering, then uh, companies would be more willing if you have some kind of that experience. So yeah, I think that's my journey. So thank you guys so much. So for next, more specifically um, about projects, where do you find inspiration for your project ideas? Yeah, so for me, I think uh, my advice here is uh, work on things that are problems you want to solve, like problems that you are having, right? So, um, and they don't have to be big things that can be small things. So just like a couple examples uh, for me, like um, when I was in school, we played a lot of Dota um, <laughs> in the computer lab. And uh, one problem we were having was uh, there was a wide variety of skill levels uh, of people playing. So we found it really hard to, to um, create even teams. So I created a website that we would upload our results uh, at the end of every match. And it would essentially, it was like a matchmaking service. So it would give each player a rating. Um, and then you could say like, okay, we have these 10 people, put them into the system and it'll match make and evenly create the teams according to their ratings. Um, this was basically like an MMR system. Um, so that, and this was like, you know, a long time ago, like before Dota 2, so they didn't have any of that stuff available. Um, so that was like a real problem that we were having. So I just decided to, to code a solution for that. Um, one project I'm thinking about, uh, right now, um, is, um, I play piano and, um, uh, specifically classical piano and some of the harder pieces have sections in them that are really hard to figure out like what you should do in terms of the, the fingering strategy. Um, and I've found sometimes I'll struggle with, with a section and just can't figure out a solution. And then eventually I'll find a solution online. Uh, someone who, who, who came up with a good solution and it just works for me and it just unlocks the piece for me. So there's no good resource for that right now. So I'm thinking maybe I'll start a project where it's just like a website where you can upload um, piano fingering uh, solutions for different parts of pieces. So I think it's like things that you are, problems that you are having uh, because those are the things you're actually going to put effort into solving um, rather than trying to figure out um, someone else's problem uh, because you may not be as dedicated to that. I, I would like, can I come next? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, so I'm 100% I'm aligned with Jeff. That's why I picked to come next because picking problems 
that's impacting you directly or whoever around you will will make you put more energy or to be more passionate about having those solved so you will look for creative ideas and you may come with creative ways to to achieve the the results that you are looking for i'm a mother of three boys and a girl and with the pandemic it was super crazy to stay home with all of them at the same time do work and at the same time trying to make them happy especially with the fact that by being locked in, in our houses they miss their friends they wanted to connect with people they wanted to speak to others they wanted to continue their activities so i started my own project trying to build that to figure out that way in order to to have this problem solved for them yes maybe um i don't want to say early stages but in the in the med of it but but uh, i i really felt that that because i wanted to solve a problem for my kids i i started looking for so many new areas um, and learning so many new stuff that helps me start looking for a, a better way to have the problem solved. Amazing. Thank you, guys. I think in a, for, for myself in a similar light, um, I have a really bad habit of trying to monetize any sort of hobby I might have. Um, so I'm like, hey, I like this. How do I make money? And I ruin it by doing that. But uh, before it's all ruined, I I, uh, uh, I try to approach it as like, if this actually was a business, what do I need to do? Um, and have and I've found ways to get to solutions a lot quicker and a lot cheaper because it's, I, you know, I recognize like this is a hobby. I'm not going to sink a ton of money into it, um, except when I decided to do coffee roasting. That was expensive. I shouldn't have done that. Um, but it was an exercise in 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 getting a, a store up and running. I didn't use Shopify, sorry, Jeff. Um, but um, it was just to like to see see what's possible, right? Um, and and it's something that you do like and enjoy. And in this particular case, it was never necessarily um, true problems. It was more just like interests that I can um, uh, just latch onto, and then and then apply similar approaches that have uh, applied and refine them further and um you know registering businesses developing a brand for them all those kind of things just start to become second nature for me which um which i've been able to apply at work uh a lot so um i don't recommend ruining hobbies like that but um that's that's what i've i've done that's why i like formula one i can't make my, any money off of it so um i just watch it <laughs> Okay, I think I'll echo what Jeff, Iman, and Carlos really said is about, you know, like identifying that problem. I think a lot of times we are always thinking about, you know, trying to come up with an original idea. And, and I feel like, you know, coming up with an original idea is not that important. Like you don't have to necessarily go and create the next Facebook or the next, you know, Instagram, stuff like that. The thing is that think about even the existing things. How can you improve it? even if it's like by, you know, 5%, even if it's by 10%, if you can improve the experience in today's day and age, you know, it's all about the experience, right? The reason we even go to a restaurant is for the experience. The reason, I mean, we could eat at home, we could do a lot of things at home. I think with the pandemic, we have kind of realized that everything, you know, can be achieved at home pretty much, but it's about the experience. So I think that, you know, if you can think about how you can improve the experience uh, for, you know, people around you, that's one great way to come up with a I would say like your project. I would say for me, like what it really inspired me to come up with a hackathon was this that um, when I was in my second year up until then, I'd never participated in one. And so when I would ask people, what is a hackathon? Uh, the kind of de definition I got was really strange. They were like, oh, it's a two day event where you don't take shower and you know, you are just staring at a computer screen and um, you know, you eat junk food and there are boys all around like and they're sweating and that's it and i'm like oh my god i don't want to be part of something like that and then you know i realized a lot of girls wouldn't go to hackathons um and and i felt you know what if you know more girls did start going to hackathon because then i would hear about you know one of my guy friends who would be like you know saying that oh he's landed some sort of an internship opportunity because he you know kind of participated in this hackathon or won something and um 
I did participate in one, but I think they were all guys. And I felt like, you know, what would the experience look like if it was just girls? And because I couldn't find any in Canada, I thought, you know, why don't I go ahead and create one? So I would say like, you know, try to look for gaps, not necessarily like solving a big problem, but even if there's a small gap that you can help um, fix, I think that probably is the best way to come up with, you know, what your next project can potentially be. So, yeah, I can go next and uh... One disadvantage of going fifth is that like uh, almost everything that you want to say is covered. So, <laughs> but uh, so I mean I think the, what everybody said it's like um, I think great idea. One additional source of inspiration that has come um, I mean for me is that um, like since I also did some of the research projects was that like once you like read enough uh, like papers or stuff like that then automatically like you generate new ideas and you see like um, holes that. Um, that is a problem that we can solve and build a solution for them. And one advantage, like if you can, like kind of like, um, if any of you are able to solve a research problem or make some progress there is that um, it can generally lead into like multiple artifacts. So one is that it could establish you as like a good researcher. Um, uh, it could generate a paper out of it. It could also generate like a proper GitHub code project. So that's, I found advantage that like um, it's, um, it covered like multiple things that, uh, many times companies uh, recruiters are looking for. So yeah, that's additional, but uh, I mean, I think all the ideas that have been covered before um, are definitely something great source for the personal projects or for the course projects. For sure, okay. Thank you guys. And now for our next question, what common misconceptions do students have about your field of study? Um, yeah, so I guess a couple things. So. One was like uh, when I was a student, I guess I, I think I was pretty naive and I thought, you know, just if you completed your degree and had good marks, uh, it would be pretty easy to land a job. Um, I think that's not exactly true. Um, from my experience on, you know, being the person on the other side who's like filtering through the resumes and um, doing the interviewing and stuff. Um, a typical thing I would see is like at the last company I worked at, uh, Zenreach, we would get, you know, 100 or 200 uh, co-op resumes coming in. And this is like a small company and probably not a lot of people have heard of it. Um, and so we're picking, you know, two or something co-ops out of those 100 or 200. And so if all you have is like, I completed my coursework and had good grades, then um, you, you essentially got thrown out <laughs> immediately because there's so many people in those 100 or 200 that have uh, relevant experience, right? Either they have a previous co-op or they have side projects um, that, are the, that show they've built something. Um, so it's really hard to compete um, if all you have is your, your degree essentially. Um, and then the other misconception I think a lot of people have is that tech stack matters a lot, which I don't think is true. So for example, if you're applying, if you see a job posting and they're looking for someone who, I don't know, knows Go, for example, like, um, and you've never even heard of Go, um, I don't think that matters. Um, as long as you know, one or two programming languages, you should be able to pick up another one. And I think a lot of employers uh, realize this um, and they expect you to just learn the programming language on the job. Um, I mean, knowing the language, the specific language and te other technologies that that company uses is like a bonus, uh, but I don't think it should disqualify you. Um, so I would say don't avoid jobs just because you don't know what the languages or other technology like databases or cloud providers or whatever. Uh, I could go next. Um, the, um, it's funny. So my, well, my field of study is, was business. I'm now uh, in design. Um, and, uh, so I'll, I'll kind of try to answer the in-between of all of that is, um, I, I think the, what's interesting is I got into design before you could necessarily go to school for it 
in in what we call it today. Uh, you know, you could do fine arts, you could do um, graphic design, um, and perhaps the closest thing I had never heard of until you know five years ago was systems engineering at, at UW, for example. I was like, what the heck is that? I mean, nobody told me that was a thing. Um, but um, so I, the, I think the misconception is that you have to ha you have to have an education in it, and it's like, well, I didn't. Right, like so, uh, there there are other ways to um, to get into the fields that we're in in, in tech, um, you know. And I I chose not to go down the development path, but at a moment in my career, I had the opportunity to like, do I is that what I want to focus on? And I decided, nope, I've explored it enough, um, but I think my passion is somewhere else, um, and and made a change. So. Um, certainly helps, obviously, <laughs> and I'm sure uh, uh, the, the other panelists would would uh, uh, be testaments to that. But um, but yeah, there you know in in design, I think it's actually very helpful that people have different backgrounds. So uh, bring bringing those perspectives in uh, is really important. I think I can go next. I think one of the biggest misconceptions about my field. So I did computer science. And is this that, you know, once you graduate from a computer science degree that you must become either a programmer or a software engineer, like they think that's the only path. And, and I feel like sometimes after doing four years, people realize that, you know, they don't want to be a programmer because the thing is that, you know, working on your own project is very different than working at a company. You know, might be excited when you're working on your personal project that, you know, oh my God, I, I made this, I made that. But when you work for a company, a lot of times you're just debugging. You're part, you're playing a very small role uh, in this, you know, like a huge giant machine. And so sometimes I, I would say after some time, a lot of people, they start, I would say, almost resenting their job because they're like, well, you know, we joined, you know, we wanted to do programming because of the creative aspect of it, but now we're not enjoying it anymore. And I tell a lot of people that you, you, that you see in my case, I was actually offered a software engineer position um, you know, before I even graduated and I, and I said no uh, immediately. And it's funny because I didn't have anything else on my hand at that time. And I remember not being excited when I was you know, offered that role. It's because I realized very early on that you know, my passion wasn't just sitting behind a desk and you know, debugging and decoding like all day long. And I would say to the people who can do that, like I have huge respect and kudos, but I just felt like it wasn't the right fit with my personality. But I still love technology and, you know, the logical thinking and everything that computer science was all about. And I love the, I would say, intersection of business and, and you, I would say, technology. And so I would say, luckily, even without me having to try, I would say I was offered a role of like, you know, kind of like almost like an IT consultant slash, you know, business technology specialist right off the bat and was able to do things that I really like. But I think so. I think that's what I like tell people that don't get fixated with just, you know, like, you know, finding a, a job that's, you know, either related to software engineering or programming there are a lot of other things you can do with a computer science degree so i would say like have a much broader perspective you know instead of narrowing yourself down if you love that i would say there are so many amazing opportunities you know for programmers software engineers i think every company needs more of them but if you realize that you know that's not your passion then don't be like oh well i wasted my time and this degree was useless there's so much more you can do with this degree mm -hmm. Uh, very, very similar to uh, Farzia. Yeah. I, uh, but the difference here is that I tried uh, doing the technical work by myself for two years. I was doing that. Um, however, I didn't have that passion while doing it. That's why I thought maybe in the, while taking the first job, I thought maybe it's the company. Let me try something else. I changed to another company, but still I didn't get that. I didn't feel that passion or, or that interest in doing that technical work. And I started exploring it within myself and uh, the people around me um, even started giving me lots of hints and advices about uh, trying to go in the sales um, direction and the business direction where I was not very confident that I will be successful in there. But uh, when I when I got an an, um, an offer or a call from Microsoft for for a business role at that time uh, and decided to go and try it, I found that I was successful and the understanding the, the good and the strong understanding of the technology helped me be a successful salesperson within that technology um, organization. And uh, I cannot forget that I was a 200 percent overachiever from my first quarter. So it was it was a big achievement and it was the sign that I got in order to decide staying for a longer time in the 
sales and business um, field? Uh, yeah, so I can go next. And so I, I think um, like maybe I can uh, try to talk about two misconceptions. One is in general, like uh, people applying for jobs. And so like uh, whenever I talk to like uh, students, like I think many people, um, like they feel that like they're really scared and they're, they're not qualified for the position. So they, and they think that like, oh, we don't have this experience, like, um, um, or um, like companies, like this is like a, let's say if they're applying for Google or Amazon, Shopify, like some of the big names or some of the like more technical challenging um, interview processes, they would like, oh, I think we need more time to prepare. And I think that's kind of misconception is that um, when you're applying uh, the, the interview will be according to your level. And uh, so it's like, it would be based on the entry level. And so there is like, you should definitely go ahead and try for the, those kind of jobs. Um, it's also like a good experience um, for your longer term, but also if um, you might succeed and you might end up getting like a dream job uh, that you're looking for. Uh, the second misconception I talk, want to talk about more about the like machine learning AI, which is like um, kind of a really hard field right now. And, um, and again, I think there uh, one of the common misconception is that like people, most people think that you have to have really strong projects, really strong papers or some um, amazing internships to actually enter the field. And again, that's not the true, that's not true is because um, like modern industrial machine learning is way more than just having some papers or some like a research uh, particular type of uh, experience. It's like they need like uh, data engineers, research engineers, um, software engineers who can, who can do who are very good like in A-B testing, online testing. So there's like a whole portfolio of things that like companies are looking for when they're looking for like in the field of ML. And then like, and more and more like these days, like the companies are understanding the value of having a, a breadth of ML experience. Mm -hmm. So again, the idea there is that like, like uh, if you're a student and interested in like applying for machine learning AI jobs, um, there are a variety of them. And so uh, try different categories and something might be your strength um, and the companies might be looking for experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And next, so how useful are external certifications such as AWS certifications or Azure certifications? Um, yeah, so I, I don't have these, so I can't uh, exactly answer how useful I think they are uh, like to the person who knows the knowledge. Uh, but um, as someone who is going through uh, resumes, um, and as someone who's hired people with and without them, um, my kind of take when I'm kind of ranking people, when I'm looking at resumes, is that they don't matter that much. Um, I would say they're like a bonus. Um, so for example, if my company is working with um, Google Cloud Platform and you have that you have a certification for that, then that's a bonus. Um, it's definitely not required. And I wouldn't say that it is more important than sort of relevant experience. I can go next. Uh, I think the answer to this question, um, maybe uh, there is no, or there is no like, a right or wrong answer for it. It depends. It's based on the requirement of that role. It depends on how uh, how open you are to learn new stuff every every time, and how open you are to to learn the differences between the different choices when it comes to cloud platforms and others. Where where some companies are looking for that. So so um, if you are um, yes, maybe there is an organization who are fully, for example, built on. A, uh, this cloud platform, they may be interested to hire someone coming from a different uh, platform background to figure out the differences, what they are missing, what they need to look for more, what, what, what extra benefits or, or business value they can bring to themselves or for their customers if they are a system integrator or, or others. So, um, so again, there is no right or wrong. The more you learn, the better for you, but based on the, the, the path that you uh, built for yourself. If, if, uh, since you mentioned in the question Azure certifications, I personally went through the Azure fundamentals, uh, fundamentals and the Azure AI, and I found them super useful. 
very useful, very easy to be taken, very easy to be understood. And there are kind of a short and small assignments while going through the learning path that will help you understand every each step. And this will help you from an Azure perspective, learn the platform, uh, learn its, its capabilities, know what are the workloads that you can think about while implementing your projects and others. So I would definitely recommend them. Uh, from the others, there is there is like a different options for, for the students between free or paid. If you are more into business um, kind of learning path, you can try AI business school. If this is something that, if AI is a topic that, that uh, that makes you more interested about it. I will put the links on the uh, on the chat window here for everyone who's looking to to leverage those and uh, and learn more about them. Perfect, amazing, thank you. And it, I, I think maybe I can answer. I think I can answer, I would say specific to cybersecurity, for example. I think a lot of the answers are similar that yes, it depends. But I think what I want to, one thing I do want to emphasize is if you're like a student right now, then when companies are hiring you, they're not expecting you to have all these certifications. The idea is that, you know, you work for a few years and a lot of the certifications, at least like the one in cybersecurity, the one that is, I would say, regarded highly is the CISSP. Um, you need to have at least, I would say, five years of experience. You can get it without the five years experience, but you are only going to be called an associate to fully qualify, you know, for that or to say that I hold the certification, you need to have, you know, five years experience. Similarly, let's say if you want to get into project management, PMP is another highly regarded, I would say, certification, but you need three years of experience. So I, and a lot of time, these companies, they pay for you to get trained and get these certifications. So I would say if you're really like set you know in your mind that yes this is what i want to do let's say if i want to get into cybersecurity, then cissp is the ultimate certification that you can get it's good to i would say start studying for it early or you know start preparing for it early but i would say don't i would say put that kind of pressure on yourself that i must get certification because like i said when they're hiring new graduates they look at other things and not just certification specifically yeah so i can go next and uh... My answer would be, I think, very similar aligned to what Fer, uh, Ferzia and uh, Jeff had to say. Like, um, I think um, it doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't matter that much. And I think these certifications are actually better suited for industrial professionals rather than like the students. Um, I mean, one thing is also like um, many of the, the top certifications actually cost a lot of money. So as a student, like it might be really hard for you to actually afford some of these. Um, so, um, and again, as I said, like that's some of the companies that they're looking for, they, it's easier to demonstrate your skills, um, in projects, uh, rather than a certification, but, um, yeah, I think it's, um, like, um, I said earlier than like, it could definitely be added bonus in your profile and your resume that if you've actually pursued some of them, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, just don't, maybe just don't stress too much about like, if you don't have one. Yeah, I, I I think I'd like, uh, I'd add that um, a lot of the tools in, in design don't even come with certifications. Um, but uh, what's really important is to be adaptable because you're not going to be picking the tools a lot of the times, right? So um, you might be certified in something which just shows like, you know, um, you know, you, you are capable of, of, of learning and using, uh, using the tools. Uh, but they might have a very different uh, workflow and, and you need to show that you can adapt to it. So um, it is, it's not going to be a shoe in for, um, well, now that I know this, then I'm going to get a job and only look for this. Um, you'll, you know, you'll want to keep the, the options open uh, no matter what they're, what they're using. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And now we're going to move on to our next section of questions. So we can start with Shiktiz, you can go first and then we'll go to Aman for Zia and then back that way. So um, now that you have reached a certain point in your career, do you still have the time to work on personal projects? Um, I do sometimes, but not that much. I think um, like for me, it's like, um, um, I think it's, I think more now it's like that if I have a personal problem that I'm struggling with and if I need to build a technological solution for that, uh, then I would uh, try to take a project. Um, like um, if I have to build on my own website, if I'm trying to build something or doing automation, then I would do, but not in general, just for building the resume part of it. 
but i would like to say that like um i think since um i um i like have uh, like like to do some research so still i would try to take on some research projects and i think the idea there is i think what have been i did earlier that like i don't want to uh, get burned out or that feel that like i'm not innovating in that aspect like and so if i'm continuing working on some of the research problems that give me motivation to continue on working on the, some of those problems mm-hmm. so yeah i think that's my uh, journey has been in the personal projects mm-hmm. Can go to Iman. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, um, not much time on on uh, uh, personal projects in the term projects. As I mentioned, I, I have uh, um, uh, I have a good time saved every day for my family because I have uh, young kids that I'm busy growing up and and making sure that they are also well educated. However. I'm very much passionate about learning new stuff. And we are in the technology industry um, and in this sector specifically, you need to keep yourself up to date always, not only about what, where are you working or what are the technologies that you are interested about. You have to keep yourself updated about what others are doing. What's what's new in the market? What are, what are the expected kind of new projects or new changes in the technology market that, that we are expecting to come, which is, going to be very important to to be up to date to learn more about them and to read so i'm i'm using the time um from from um personal projects perspective to learn more and to do more studies i i I'm just, like a year ago i got my master's degree in international business management where i picked to go in that uh, path um to, to enrich my knowledge when it comes to leadership and, and business focus, because I found myself very passionate around that. So yeah, that's it. Perfect, thank you. Um, I think I can go next. I would say for personal projects, it really depends. You know, there are times when your work is so busy and you have to give your 100%. So let's say if you're studying in your career, at that point, it may be best to like give a lot of your focus to your career, you know, make good, good impression and stuff like that. But I think at the same time, I personally think it's really important to also work on things that interest you. So for example, I would say, although I work, I also have a blog called Top Student Advice, where I, you know, I interview different people, a lot of like executives or, um, you know, some students, and just like post those interviews on my website. Basically, it's about, you know, giving, um, and I would say it probably would be a good source for a lot of you as well, where, you know, I ask a lot of these executives, these, um, I would say, Uh, business leaders and CEOs about their experience as a student because you know when you see somebody successful and up there you always think like oh my god how did they even get there but you have to remember at some point they're also students so I think I have a blog on that again am I like posting every single day no I don't have the capacity to do so but whenever I get the time I, I will go ahead and post on my blog Um, I would say apart from that, I also started my own subscription company uh, that kind of delivers curated, you know, boxes on things that, you know, should technically be taught in school, but they're not taught in school on topics like investment, you know, you know, networking, personal relationships, physical health, nutrition, all that stuff that, you know, you should learn in school, but a lot of times that's not taught. So I do have the subscription, I would say like a company, but because currently my workload is so much, I have, you know, I temporarily paused that. But I would say that, you know, at the back of my head, I always have this thing, you know, where I'm like, okay, I also want to give X number of, you know, time to my personal project, whether it's like painting, whether it's like, you know, stuff that I'm doing on the internet. Um, I think you have to take out time for yourself. That would be my advice. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, I think for myself, it's been um, anything that might start to feel like a project. I'm very, very picky about what I might take on. Uh, and for a lot of the same reasons um, the others have already mentioned and just it's when you're already busy you want to make sure that you're spending your time wisely as well as just finding the time to relax like you you need that um, so uh, what what I've done uh, though is um, I do I, I run a, a community community called the designers table um, and that was born out of me just reaching out to other designers over coffee back when it was a uh, over coffee kind of thing. Uh, and we've moved all of that online. And that's something that uh, I put in perhaps a few hours a month to get uh, set up for the month. And then it runs and other people host tables and other designers go to them. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's things like that, that still, I'm still passionate about. 
Um, and but but I also look at the ways that it's like, how do I do this uh, and not have it become a second job, basically, right? And 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 but still uh, scratch the itch to um, still apply new ideas and whatnot, and uh, also provide back to the community. Yeah, I think I think my take on this is like different people have different um, amounts that they can tolerate doing their job uh, uh, all day, right? So like some people's limit is, you know, the eight hour work day. And then it's like, you just need to disconnect from doing programming and or anything related to that. Um, and then some people are just the type of person that just want to do that all the time. Um, so for me personally, I've, I've found that while I have ideas that I would love to work on, I find I'll start on a project and then realize like, this is just too much for me outside of work. So um, the only kinds of things I have really followed through on are very small personal projects, uh, things that have very limited scope um, and things that are solving problems for myself. Um, and I think one, one thing that's easy to do is to see people who are like working full time and creating all these things on the side and stuff and get a little intimidated. And I would say that's probably not the, the norm um, and that you don't have to do that. Thank you. And for our next question, do you guys have any examples of tools and technologies that you are using in your current field of work? Uh, yeah, so I can go first. And uh, so I think, um, I don't know, it's an advantage, disadvantage of working at Google is that like uh, almost everything that tools and technology they use there is internal. So uh like uh, from code versioning system to um like even like a lot of actually code functions and stuff is like quite internal so they don't really translate that much to the the industrial like the popular products and i think um in terms of like i think the tool that i'm using most is like maybe tensorflow that people are familiar but then again there are internal wrappers on top of it uh which makes it experience bit different the, um, I think the idea, I think there, there is, I think what have been iterated earlier is that um, the tools and technology don't matter too much. I think once you join a new company, new job, new profile, um, you will be expected to learn them on the fly. And um, that's kind of part of your job to actually learn new tool and technology. So yeah, thanks. And maybe sharing the same um, situation uh, here, being at Microsoft. So uh, lots of Microsoft internal um, um, programs, resources, apps that we are using. The one that I would really here uh, like to uh, to um, to mention is Microsoft Teams and, and how amazingly it is connecting everyone together between internal and external. It was amazing. To, to see how uh, customers are joining our training um, sessions and workshops, hands-on labs workshops over Teams. So, so this, this was awesome. So Microsoft Teams definitely um, um, something that we are using daily basis, um, especially with the remote um, uh, workplace here. Um, so yeah, this is the majority of it. Now, while talking about it from Azure and, and development, um, which is, uh, I'm not deeply in. However, we have a huge and big team who are working on technical implementations. The fact that um, Azure supports um, open source is, is also uh, adds uh, lots of value and gives the, the technical team the, the, the possibility to leverage other technologies. So this is itself, I see it as big advantage. So. I, I don't want to sound as doing uh, marketing here for Microsoft only and speak at all with about it, but this is translating how, how impressed we are with the technology we are using daily basis. So definitely I would recommend for those who are interested to learn more, to go and explore the Azure Fundamentals course, um, you will definitely learn a lot. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think in, in almost everyone's job, I think the tool that we most commonly use these days is I think the collaboration tool. So I would say our company, we also mostly use like Microsoft tools to so Office 365, right? So that includes the OneDrive, the SharePoint, the you know Teams and all, all of that stuff. When it comes to a lot of technical tools in cybersecurity, I would say it's different because I think there isn't like programming and stuff involved, but there are specific tools that you can use to you know, identify some incidents or threats and stuff like that. And again, like, again, they're very specific, I would say, you know, industry based tools that you can use. But I think one thing that I want to emphasize on is this that whenever you're thinking about maybe learning or picking up a tool, think about the long term, you know, impact of it, because um, tools come come and go all the time. So if you're too fixated on like, you know, okay, I'm going to learn this tool where within five years, it might be outdated. That's how fast technology is. So I think it's more about like creating the right mindset. I would say at least in my field, because when you're, let's say in cybersecurity, it's more about, you know, how do you like, you know, react to an incident? How do you analyze like a fraud, you know, incident when that happens? Um, you know, what kind of decision do you make and what kind of connections do you make? I think so having that mindset is more important rather than fixating on the tool because tools, I would say they get updated all the time. Some of it, it gets outdated, you know, it gets refreshed and stuff like that. But I would say there are some big tools. So if you want to get into, I think I'm not in, in I would say the field of, um, I'm not a data scientist and I think Iman is probably the best person, but I think Azure and AWS for any, who is interested in, you know, data to be a data scientist, that would be great. If you want to get into programming, I think Python, JavaScript, and, you know, again, those languages probably are, might be the best way to start. If you're into cybersecurity, then I think that there are some tools like Splunk and stuff, but I think more than the tool, it's about, you know, thinking with the right mindset of how you can analyze those threats and stuff. So, yeah, and I would say that, of course, we all are using collaboration tools. So I think that's, that's, that's just a given. Thank you. Uh, uh, for me, uh, I severely miss uh, the whiteboard with other people around it. Um, so I mean, I have my own too, just like Jeff does there. Um, but uh, so the closest thing I have found is Miro, uh, M-I-R-O. Uh, there's also something called Mural. Um, and they're just, they're, they're much more freeform collaboration tools. You're there together. You're using fake sticky notes. Uh, you're drawing boxes, you're drawing connections. And uh, I have found that to be, uh, especially uh, uh, right now, uh, an incredibly uh, useful tool to have, um, to have slightly less structured conversations, um, but still capture those, those ideas, those thoughts, um, and, and bring people together and, and discuss where, you know, it's something as low tech as a, a whiteboard or a chalkboard that is super valuable in person, which we can't do right now. Um, you know, finding finding things that still facilitate those kind of conversations that I, I think are still critical to have um, uh, right now. Uh, yeah, so for me, like as a software developer, um, the kind of kind of tools uh, you use generally are well, so, everyone's going to have uh, a programming language they're going to be writing in, but you're probably going to want to be familiar with at least one back end and one front end where basically the only front end language is JavaScript. Um, so you pretty much have to learn JavaScript and then um, some back end language, unless you really want to specialize. Um, you need, you probably need to know some database. So I would suggest if you have to learn one, pick some, uh, SQL database to start with, uh, relational databases are everywhere. Um, since everything's on the web these days, you probably need to do something to do with networking. So you're learning, you know, HTTP REST or GraphQL or gRPC, um, something like that. But, um, companies more and more these days are using event driven um, systems too um, to talk between services. So like Kafka um, would be a, a good example of that. Um, cloud, uh, being familiar with cloud platforms. And then like other people have mentioned um, collaboration tools. So like your day-to-day -day things that you're using are like Git, like everyone needs to know Git if you're the software developer. Um, some kind of project management tool like Jira, um, 
Carlos mentioned Miro. I use that all the time for, for kind of designing and doing architecture type stuff or just drawing with people. And then some kind of wiki related thing as like a knowledge base. Thank you. And now we're gonna move on to our job related section of questions. So we can start again with Jeff and then go through all of you. So how do you keep up to date with your field's current practices and new technologies? Yeah, so one thing I discovered, uh, I, I worked at BlackBerry a, a long time ago, and something I discovered there was when you're taking breaks, um, you can choose to, you know, go to Reddit or Twitter or whatever, or you can choose to take what I call like a productive break. So like you're not, you know, programming or working on your work directly, but maybe you're you're learning about something um, related to your work. So maybe you're interested in some other type of uh, database or another language, or maybe you just have a problem you've been thinking about um, going and reading about it. So maybe you go to a blog or watch a YouTube video on, on it, or you go to Hacker News, um, or it could even be just something like, hey, I wonder what this team at my company is working on and just like browse through their projects and see what's going on. Those types of breaks are like, you're breaking from your normal day-to-day -day work, but you're still like building knowledge. Um, and then the, yeah, the a couple other things. So one is, um, and it's a little harder now that everyone's virtual, but, um, making an effort to talk to coworkers that aren't on your team. Mm -hmm. So just figuring out what are other people working on, what are the problems they're having and how are they solving it? Uh, will kind of like introduce you to problems you've never really thought about before. Um, and solutions you've never really thought about before. Um, and even talking to people, like if you're a software developer, go talk to the, the product manager on the other team, right? Um, you're gonna learn a lot of stuff about like, you know, what the customers are thinking, for example. Um, that's a really hard thing to, that those types of connections are hard to make when you're, when you're a software developer sometimes, so. Yeah. Um, for myself, uh, do a lot of reading. Uh, it is, um, I have a big backlog of books I haven't read yet, but I keep buying on Amazon. Um, so um, that's, uh, that's usually my go to. Uh, and then the other side of it uh, was, uh, especially when I just started uh, the designers table, um, I, I was coming from a place I, I tend towards smaller companies and the idea of having a design team was non-existent. So the only connections I could find were from other people at other companies. So that became, that became the start of that network. Um, but that was, that was a way to, to, to find out. It's like, what are you doing? How do you solve this problem? Um, and understanding the different processes and approaches other people were taking. So um, that's pretty much all I rely on these days. Um, I, go in and out of paying attention to what design Twitter is saying, or I think I've given up on medium. I, I can't, I don't know, uh, but um, everything's paid for now under medium too. So, um, but um, yeah, that, that stuff, it, it starts to become like very repetitive. I, I think um, it very, very good content. Uh, but uh, you know, when you have a conversation with somebody, then you actually get to really hear how they're applying that um, and in and, and a real world uh, scenario uh, with, with more context. So uh, yeah, uh, the reading and then conversations. I would say myself, like Carlos, I love reading. So I'm always reading a book or two on either self-development, uh, business or entrepreneurship. I would say outside of STEM, those are particularly my interests, like business and entrepreneurship and um, also arts, I would say, because I like to paint and stuff like that. So those are the stuff that I like to check out. So yeah, I would say I'll keep my answer short. And so that's what I'm interested in um, outside of STEM. 
Same here. Uh, I would echo Carlos and uh, Farzia here as well, reading and conversations. I love connecting with people. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, definitely an area that uh, I love always to spend the time on and, and reading, not only um, and related to what I'm doing and my future plans, but also, as I mentioned, around the, my fun fact, uh, of um, of having a hobby to spend time on cooking. I read the international recipes and I implement them when, when it makes sense. Uh, yeah, so for me, like I think um, one of the big way to connect and like be aware of the field is I find like the internal external conferences. So I try to like ensure that like um, I at least attend a couple of external ones or maybe at least one in external one per year and try to attend at least two or three internal conferences um, within the company uh, to keep myself updated update on like um, what's happening what's like the um, uh, like latest field how the field is progressing so there um, even if like um, if I'm not able to grasp like the whole content I think it just gives me a good idea that how the field is progressing and what are some of the things that I want to catch up with uh, and besides, like, I think everybody said, like, um, reading on a daily basis or um, whenever I get time um, has been one of the most uh, important, like, uh, ways. Um, and, like, yeah, I guess, like, uh, in addition, like, basically, like, it's not just have to be, like, attending the conference. Like, sometimes I just, um, like, per week, I try to attend at least one or two talks, which is just purely for the educational purpose, where I have uh, no intention of, like, maybe like um, having any productive outcome related to my work, but it's just purely from my uh, professional growth in the sense that I just want to learn something new. And it could be about anything, like, I mean, for uh, uh, technical, non-technical, self-development, um, or any such things. So yeah, that has been my strategy to like um, keep up with the new stuff. Mm -hmm. And what advice do you have on career development in your current field? And what do you guys recommend students focus their time on outside of school? Right, so um, I think this has been said a bunch, but um, the biggest things you need are to demonstrate you have experience and gaining connections to um, actually get get an interview at a at a company it, like it's really hard to just hand out resumes and get interviews if if you're or maybe it's not really hard all the time but um having a connection there it, it makes it a lot easier because they can just put you into the system and then you'll get to talk someone to someone um so that would be like um, getting in and then in terms of like career development once you already have a job um, so one thing I've kind of learned is that in order to advance kind of to the next level um, you need to be doing work at that level before you get that promotion um, so you need to start taking on more responsibility than is expected of, of you at your current role um because if you can demonstrate that you know you are doing the same work as say a senior developer uh, but you're only an intermediate developer um then that's a really easy argument for you to make to your manager like hey i've been doing all these things um, that senior developers do um like i feel like i'm ready for for a promotion and then being able to have discussions with your manager about your career development is really important. I think a lot of people, so tip, a typical thing that you'll have is like a one-on-one -on -one meeting every week or two with your manager. And you should be using that time pretty frequently to talk about your career growth. Mm -hmm. So things like, um, you know, what will it take to get uh, a promotion? Like what, what are the things that I'm not doing right now? Because essentially they can, they should be able to come back with a, a, like a list of checkboxes almost. And if you're filling in all those checkboxes, then um, you're making a really good argument for yourself. And they're they're the ones who are responsible for putting your name forward for a promotion, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then another piece of advice um, I got early on in my career is like, 
know who the people are that are going to be the the people who are responsible for for having input or making the decision around uh, your career growth. So, for example, like a typical process at a company, you'll have like a yearly or um, maybe every six months uh, review. Um, and it's going to be your manager is obviously going to uh, review you and also take input from a bunch of your peers. So usually you'll have two or three people who are your peers that you suggest should um, uh, give review uh, feedback to your manager. So you should, you should know who those people are and you should know, you should make, make it known to them what you're working on and what your accomplishments are. And by that, I don't mean like bragging or anything, but like um, they should be on your code reviews a lot. Um, so that they know the, the quantity and quality of your work. Um, if, if you build something cool that's useful for the team, make sure that they know about it, that you built that so that they can use it and they see like, oh, you know, Jeff's doing, uh, worked on something that was useful to me, that's great. So when it comes to them, it's time for them to like provide feedback for you, they can point to specific things that you've done. It makes it very easy for them to give good feedback for you. So I think, yeah, those would be my main points. I can go next here also talking, I uh, would start with the career development, uh, echoing what Jeff uh, mentioned about taking more responsibilities and um, stretch projects. This is very important to help you as an employee to figure out um, um your next step so so you try it without having a risk so go for it try it build build the skills that you need to build um after trying the jobs itself or maybe um shadow one of the um existing employees who are doing that stuff today or team members from the other side make sure that you have a mentor within the organizations you are working on. Having a strong mentor will be very helpful to you to help you build your, your path or career development path. So this is, this is very important uh, towards a successful career journey. Now, when it comes to students and, and especially with this uh, critical time of COVID and uh, the fact that um, uh, the in-person um, moments um, are, are very limited, very, very limited. So I would uh, advise them to look into meetups, virtual meetups, and, um, all, all the, more, the, the, the chances they may get to connect with other people. Um, as a result of events, um, Q and A's, discussions, or, mom, or or marketing moments, they would find for vendors or even for um, organizations. I, I know that there are lots of new groups that started showing up today, where they are connecting technical people or um, new graduates or even existing students, where they give them the platform to discuss, to talk with others, and. To, to listen to, uh, to other people's stories and journeys. So those would be a, a good um, kind of um, um, opportunities to, to help them figure out the, 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 their next step maybe, or, or the next topic to read about, or the next um, um, language to, to, um, to get trained on. So um, which is the way that we are driving conversations today with the fact that we don't have the chance to meet people in person. I think I can go next, Iman. If um, I think again, those are great points. I think everybody mentioned networking, so I, I will not repeat that. But I think two things that you can really do when you're in school. Again, let's say if you're in your first year, second year, or third year, what I would really highly suggest you to do is, you know, perhaps talk to people who are in their fourth year, who have already gone through internships, you know, or ask them about, you know, like how did they get that internship? Which company, you know, what is the culture of that company? And do I would say talk to I would say the current students. It's so much easier for you to connect with, you know, like students in your university versus you know somebody who's in the industry. Second, I would say like when you're in university, this is a great time to build your skills. I, I think a lot of students they focus so much on like you know 
on their technical skills that they really miss out on building their soft skills. Try to identify. It's so easy, like, you know, what are the skills that you need today? Is it your communication skills? Is it your presentation skills? Is it your EQ or public speaking skills? Or what are your confidence in general? I would say identify what your weaknesses are. And then I would say identify what your strengths are. Once you've identified your weaknesses, just think about it and see, is it important for you to, you know, work on those weaknesses? Is it something, let's say, if I have weak communication skills, you know, I can't just be like, oh, well, you know, that's a weakness. I'll just let go off. But you can't in today's day and age. Communication is very important. So you must work on it, I would say, when you're in school. At the same time, identify your strengths. And what you want to do with your strengths is you want to further amplify it. And for your career development, I, I feel like the best thing you can do is think of yourself as a brand. And when you think of yourself as a brand, you will start, I would say, marketing yourself in that way. Creating a brand for yourself early on in your career is going to be, I would say, a huge game changer. I, I, I can give example that, you know, when you buy, for example, when you buy a normal shoes, uh, a $60 shoes, you know, you're like, okay, whatever. But when you go for a specific brand, is it Yeezy or like, you know, Nike, you're willing to pay way more. So employers see you in that same way. I was able to, for example, negotiate a much, much higher salary, you know, compared to what a new graduate would get just because I had been building that brand. So if you have that brand, you know, whether it's through LinkedIn, whether it's through connections or, you know, through like other kind of side projects, once you have that brand built, I would say it's so much easier. A, everyone would want to hire you. Second, it's going to be so much easier for you to negotiate salary. At that point, I would say you won't have to go in and apply for jobs companies will be coming and running after you and you know offering you jobs so i would say if there's only one advice i can um, give is like think of yourself as a brand and start thinking about how you can build that brand based on your strengths okay. um uh, i would say to keep reminding yourself of finding out what you want to do uh, not what you can do not what uh your your skills say you can do um and and make sure that you're, you're always questioning, like, is this what I want to do? I something I've always looked at is, do I want to be my boss? And oftentimes that's when I realize, like, oh, no, God, no, I don't want to. And, and, and I moved, I, I, I switched jobs. Um, and uh, a trick that works well, especially in larger companies is look at internal hiring. You're already in and it's the easiest way to, to get a, a, a start in a different, in a different field because you already have the context of the company and they value that so much, uh, and people are usually very willing to make that make that opportunity happen. So, uh, larger organizations uh, have that uh, readily available and encourage it. So, um, uh, exploit it as much as you can. Um, yeah. So I think um, um, again, I think like the. Um, the idea is, I think almost all the excellent advice have been given, and um, my um, I think I would really echo with what Jeff, uh, Fazia, Imam, and um, Carlos had to say. But in addition, like I think um, my my experience as like university that which I would say different from like um, in industries that like as a in university. I ensured that I take on like a breadth of different things that I just explore whatever I wanted to like, not worry about that, whether it's helpful for me or not. Um, if something like I want to do a project, I want to go for a hackathon, I want to like study something. That's not like, and, and not just like, I mean, study related, anything that I wanted to do, build, go for this internship or anything. And just um, having an opportunity that like at the time, then when I graduate, I should not have regrets that like I didn't get a chance to at least pursue this. So by the time I graduate, I kind of knew that what I want to do and sort of like echoing what Carlos was saying that like just figuring out what you want to do. But for me, I think the hard part was I actually didn't know what I want to do. So when I explored the different breadth of things, I figured out that like, okay, I don't like this particular subfields of computer science or I like this particular subfields of computer science. So I think um, that was really helpful at least for me. And another one that I think, um, uh, which probably I realized um, by after coming in industry, that one thing that is really important for career development is actually your soft skills. Then you, if you're hired once, you already have the technical skills, but the thing that will actually uh, take you forward is your soft skills. Like um, for instance, at Google, like no matter what project you have to start with, like you have to write a design doc for it. 
and getting a good design doc reviewed and like accepted is a, itself a big challenge and sometimes like it's much more bigger challenge than actually coding that things uh similarly for like communicating communicating your results communicating your projects how what you are planning for uh, i think that is way more important than uh, some of the technical work that I act, like you will end up doing so i think that's something that i learned after coming to industry that like um like you probably if you're hired you already have that like the technical skills but to move forward you actually really need more on the soft skill side are you it's important to work on that perfect thank you guys so much unfortunately we do not have the time to ask um speaker specific questions but if anyone in the audience has a question you can raise your hand and i can call on you so thank you all so much for your amazing answers and here is their linkedin information if anyone would like and yeah if anyone has a question you could just raise your hand Oh, and also Iman is stepping out. So if anyone would like to ask her any more questions, you can reach out to her on LinkedIn. Let's see if I can. Yeah, Obi, you could go. Hey, I just want to say thanks to all of you guys for all the advice and uh, talking you've done today. It's been really helpful. Uh, specifically to Carlos or anybody else really that has experience, you know, with startups, what were some of the biggest action points you had to take care of in order to secure your first sale or contract? Like, how was that beginning process um, of actually, you know, I, you know, idealizing it and then going about executing it? Um, the I've I've relied on mostly connections um that that uh usually is the the biggest thing um to get the the ball rolling um oh, real quick. what what exactly are your services or products you offer uh right now so uh, i it's actually more about uh establishing team alignment uh so it's uh we're we're building out a framework to do uh alignment sprints to to get teams actually level set on the same problem usually it's not uh necessarily understood where you're where you're trying to head so everybody has their own idea of, of the problem they're trying to solve and solving it in different ways um so trying to find ways to uh to, to come together and actually get everybody on the same baseline and then start start exploring the different solutions um so i'm 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 uh, i've been I, I saw one of the questions about how long to stay at a company i'm a one-year wonder at companies i i just I, I keep seeing the same problems over and over again um especially in in this in in the small size like you know max maybe 100 people kind of uh size organizations uh where there's a lot of these struggles of trying to you know, like operationalize things and um and a lot of the times it just comes down to the communication that's not um that's not not effective and people aren't pulling in the, in the same direction. So what uh, what I'm doing right now as an example is is building it out uh, in all honesty. So it's not like I'm rolling in all these contracts and clients. Uh, it's literally yeah, what I'm, sure. I'm doing. But based on my personal experiences, uh, modeling out like what were the similarities of those organizations that I had? Is there something magic about around 100 people? Uh, what what kind of structures do they have? Um, they usually lack product management. Uh, that's that's a that's a clue that I look for. So you got to start looking and piecing together those clues, uh, and then you can model that out and try to look for more of them. Got you. Interesting. Uh, also, real quick, how exciting was it um, when you when you got that first contract you talked about? Um, uh, quite quite exciting. It was. I signed it uh, and gave my notice the same afternoon. So um, I was uh, <laughs> leaving leaving a job. So uh, it was. Uh, yeah, it's always it's always a good feeling. All right, thanks again to everybody. No problem. And see if anybody else had any more questions. You could throw it in the chat or raise your hand. Okay. And also for the sign in link to get everyone's contact info, it will be emailed to everyone who came to this event and the link is in the chat and also you can do your attendance using this qr code here in the corner Let's see anybody has any last minute questions maybe not let's see okay
give them like another minute and see if anyone can think of anything. <laughs> Okay, well, I don't think there are any more questions, but thank you so much all for your amazing answers and all the information you've shared with us today. And um, everybody is free to leave when you'd like. And thank you again to all the speakers for today. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot for having us. Yeah. One, bye bye. Ooh.